could um, yeah, make your input this afternoon. Thank you very much, Fazila. So I, I agree 100% with Numbanisa. There's a massive land grab taking place by traditional leaders with the connivance of government. Uh, two weeks ago, there was a National Land Tenure Summit. 2,000 people attended, and Minister Quinty uh, set out his communal land tenure policy, along with policies for farm workers, uh, CPAs, and so on. Um, and the communal land tenure policy proposes to transfer ownership of communal land to traditional councils. The title to the outer boundary will be held by traditional councils. Traditional councils uh, have 30% uh, elected members, 40% are supposed to be women, but uh, in fact they're controlled by, by the chiefs. Um, it, when, when questioned on, on whether or not this transfer would be constitutional, the minister said, you can win it in the courts, but I don't care, it, it doesn't change uh, power relations out in reality. Uh, which I think is an extraordinarily irresponsible thing for a minister to say. Why, why would the transfer of ownership to traditional councils be unconstitutional? Well, now we have to, I think, take a step back and ask, what is at stake here? What are we talking about when we talk about land rights in communal or customary or group-based systems? And I think the answers to that are not so simple. And uh, I think we need to steer our way carefully through a maze of, of complex uh, arguments. In, in 1994, uh, when we started our land reform program, um, this question came up immediately. Well, how are we going to secure rights to people who live in group-based systems in communal areas? Uh, clearly, we needed a tenure reform program as well as a restitution program, as well as a redistribution program. We needed some way of securing people's rights against the abuses which took place under apartheid. Uh, and two main groups were identified. Farm workers living and working on privately owned land and a series of laws and policies were put in place to give them some security against arbitrary evictions. That hasn't really worked too well. New proposals are on the table and the minister has a completely, in my view, crazy idea about transferring ownership of 50% of farms to farm workers. Not something that farm workers have ever asked for, mind you, but, and I don't think that's constitutional either, but uh, be that as it may. With regard, the other major group for whom tenure reform was identified as being an urgent need were people living in communal areas, the former Bantu states. They, why were they insecure? Partly because their rights are not clearly defined in law. They derived from custom, but they took the form of permits issued by government. Uh, in decades gone past, so-called PTOs, or permissions to occupy. These were the form of rights which were issued by magistrates with measurement of plots taking place by agricultural officers and so on. A very weak form of rights in law, uh, not fully recognized as property rights, and um, they did not provide a strong basis for people, for example, to resist forced removals within the confines of the Bantu stands, the so-called betterment planning or land use planning, which shifted people away from where their fields were, put them in villages, demarcated grazing areas, demarcated blocks of, uh, of arable land and so on, actually messed up their productive systems. But our previous government deemed this to be scientifically necessary. Um, people are now beginning to lodge land claims against that form of dispossession, but the, 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 the tenure reform issue is that their rights, their PTOs, did not provide them a strong basis in law to say to government, the government of the time, no, you can't come and do this. This is our land. We will decide where we want to live on our land. So clearly some reform was needed to give people stronger rights against abuse, firstly by the state, but also abuse by traditional leaders. And uh, nobody says 100% correct that we have colonial and apartheid constructions of traditional authority, which have uh, been put in place over the years, and which are in fact clearly highly distorted versions of what existed in the pre-colonial era. This is not a pure form of custom handed down from one generation to another. This is a particular form, particular construct of, of authority, land tenure of property rights. And it's one which, as Numbers Mesa says, authority is vested in a ruling power, a chief, a traditional authority, in a highly centralized, in effect, authoritarian form. A despotic form of government, as Mandani called it. 
and it had actually very little to do with the pre-colonial reality. Now, we, it's actually not that easy to, come to uh, say exactly what pre-colonial reality was, because these were not uh, often systems which involved writing, but our historians have done a wonderful job of reconstructing how society worked in the pre-colonial era, and the anthropologists have contributed greatly to them. And I just want to, to, uh, to, to recognize uh, one of our eminent historians, Jeff Guy, is in the room here, who's done a marvelous piece of work reconstructing uh, pre-colonial systems in the KwaZulu-Natal era. And what, what so uh, the key question is, uh, what powers did traditional leaders, notably chiefs, have over land in pre-colonial systems, and if, they are, if that was different to what it is today, then what, are, what form of reform should we be thinking about? What, what do we need to do to re provide safeguards against the abuse <coughs> that the state and traditional leaders were engaged in in the, in the apartheid period? So the, the clearest statement of alternative sets of principles for tenure reform for communal areas is, are set out in the 1997 White Paper, which starts with a very pr simple principle, the principle of choice. So nominees are people, in, according to what still stands as our official declaration of policy, people should have a choice as to what form of land tenure they should enjoy. So if they decide, as a group of people, that they want to, for example, individualize their land rights and hold private property, they should decide they should be free to do so. If they want to have chiefs, traditional leaders, administering their land, then they should be free to do so. And if they want some other version of, uh, of land holding, for example, an elected committee which makes decisions on behalf of the group, they should be free to do so. And I think this gets to the, the nub of the, of the question. Do people at the moment have freedom of choice? Well, they don't. They are corralled into old apartheid uh, era boundaries, so-called tribal boundaries, in which they have no choice, in which they are, are told that they have to be under these tr traditional leaders, like it or not, and that, uh, in fact, they will have to be, have their land administered by traditional councils. And if the government has its way, the ownership of that land will be transferred to traditional councils, and traditional councils will be able to enter into the kinds of deals that they do across the platinum belt and in, in parts of KwaZulu-Natal, they enter into deals with mining companies. Okay? And often these are set up in the name of the community but are actually private ventures, controlled by chiefs in the name of the community but with very little in the way of benefit going to anyone other than themselves and their families. This is happening not only in respect of mining but increasingly in respect of tourism deals, uh, agriculture, but also property development. We see in the Bachatla, Bachafela, Chief Balani is developing a 300 million rand uh, shopping mall, uh, using money that he's gained from platinum royalties. So the, the chieftaincy is basically diversifying its investment portfolio and using uh, the support of government to engage in a wide range of property deals. So what are the alternatives? What if, if, if if, if, this, if we agree that this is unacceptable, what kind of tenure should we put in place? What kinds of safeguards for people's rights should we put in place in, in communal areas? Well, there, there are three basic views on this. On the one hand, we have the traditional leader lobby through Contralesa, Congress of Traditional Leaders of South Africa, who says, no, we have a pure customary system, and chiefs are the trustees of the people, and we should allow them to do their job properly, um, it's good that we're paying them salaries, perhaps they need more in the way of salaries, but really they are the trustees and they, they can do a good job. And in fact, government is now beginning to uh, accede to their requests that they have significant powers over all this land. A, a second view uh, is that we should allow people the same kind of property rights that people in urban areas hold. In other words, title deeds or private property that this is the only form of property rights that are compatible with a democracy. And of course, if you give people title deeds, they'll be able to borrow money from banks, invest in that land, and economic development will take place. So this is a common uh, view across the world. It's often uh, termed formalization, and it's reckoned by some people to be uh, the royal road to development. 
But if there's a third view, and I think this is the view held by most of the rural people concerned themselves, if you go and ask them, well, who owns this land? They say, we do. And what they mean by we is not, it's not an, someone saying, I own this land individually. They're saying, we as a group own this land, collectively. And if you ask them, well, does the chief own the land? They say, no. The chief is merely an administrator. He plays certain key roles. For example, he allows us, he helps us resolve disputes amongst each other. But he is not the owner of the land. In fact, if you go and ask chiefs themselves, do you own this land? If they're honest, they will say, no, I don't. I'm an administrator. There are certain functions I perform, sometimes including vetting people who come from outside who want to come and live here. If the neighbors accept them, then I'll give them a letter saying, yes, uh, you can come and live here, but I'm not the owner of the land. So the, the, the third view is somewhere in between private ownership and between the control of the chiefs. And it is that third view which was expressed in the 1997 White Paper. And let me outline the, very briefly the key dilemma. If you take this third view and you say that we have group systems, people choose group systems, what does that imply? It implies that you have strong individual rights, but those rights are firstly held in the context of a family, they're held in the context of neighbours with which you share, with whom you share certain resources like the water, the, the trees, the grazing, and so on. And you have rights which are shared within the boundaries of the larger community. Okay. And those rights are held by individuals, but they are relative to the rights of your neighbours. They are shared rights. And this, by the way, this particular kind of, of, uh, of property system was the, the dominant one. Um, throughout the world before the 15th and 16th century when private property began to develop. And it is a long-standing system with many variations across Africa, across South Africa, across the world, and it is a very robust system. And it balances individual and family rights versus the rights of the group. And it does so through a variety of mechanisms. And it's precisely those mechanisms which have been overridden, firstly by colonial and apartheid authorities, and thirdly, by, increasingly, by the chiefs themselves with the support of the state. And it puts all the power in the hands of a centralized, feudal-like authority, which has almost no accountability to its own members. That is the distorted version of custom and customary authority, which government is supporting at the moment. The, 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 the third alternative is to, I think, is not to vest rights in it or powers in institutions, whether they be customary authority institutions or elected committees for that matter, or communal property associations. But I think the alternative is to vest rights in the members of the group, relative to the rights of others and relative to majority decision making. In other words, it's a democratization of customary tenure, helping it adapt to current circumstances to uh, our, our, and, and to be in line with our, our current constitution, and therefore it involves necessarily a commitment to gender equality. So the third, the the critique of the chief, the chief's growing powers over land and other resources is not a rejection of custom. It is not necessarily a rejection of the institution of chieftaincy itself. What it's asking for is that these institutions be accountable to the members of their groups who are in fact the true owners of those shared resources. So it's actually quite a simple idea. This idea was uh, first embodied in draft legislation in 1999. It was set aside by a new Minister of Land Affairs who put in place the Communal Land Rights Act, which once again set out to transfer ownership to traditional councils. That was set aside by the constitutional court, and we now have government reverting to exactly the same model in its new communal land tenure policy. But the alternative is not to reject custom, because people don't reject custom. What they want to do, I think, is make it compatible with modern institutions, with, modern, with democratic institutions, and, as I think uh, Mam Cezani has well expressed, Women want equal rights within such a system, and there's actually no reason why they can't be. In fact, there are arguments that women had stronger land rights pre under pre-colonial rule than they had, they had under colonial power. In other words, it would be a return to those strong rights. 
So I think there are alternatives, and we, uh, they have been developed in draft legislation. And I think the job of our society is to press hard against the unilateral and centralized powers of the chieftaincy. And there's a very real alternative which people themselves will start to talk about very eloquently if you give them a chance to. And I just want to say to Mom Susanna, there is one other traditional leader, at least in Brazil and Hotel, who is allocating land to women. That's in an area where I've worked for seven years in Msinga, where uh, Kosi Mpunu is in, and the traditional council are in fact allocating land to single women. They're doing that because there are lots of single women with children who are not married. They can't all be accommodated in their own homesteads. There's not enough space. And the traditional leadership institution has recognized that society has needs. Society has evolved. Society has moved on. And in fact, so the land tenure system needs to allocate women land in their own rights. And in fact, those, um, those kinds of shifts are taking place much more generally, but there's a backlash taking place against those kinds of changes <coughs> by the chieftaincy, particularly in areas where they have their significant resources, such as minerals, and they're at the moment being supported by government. So there's a very, very clear delineation of, of what's at stake here. And I think all of us as South Africans have to stand up and uh, ask for these things to be looked at once again. Thank you. Thank you very much for that powerful suggestion at the end as well, Ben.